Um, thanks for being here to this uh, tech talk with uh, Alessandro Aymar. Uh, I'll firstly introduce him and then I'll leave the floor. So th the talk is entitled uh, Energy Efficient Convolutional Neural Network Accelerators for Edge Intelligence, as you may know. Uh, Alessandro received both his uh, Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degree from Politecnico, his master together with uh, INP Grenoble and the EPFL in Switzerland. After working as an engineer at Imagination Technologies on the Power VR architectures powering the, at the time Apple iPhones and smartwatches, he joined the Institute of Neuroinformatics at uh, ETH Zurich for his PhD studies. In uh, 2017, he founded Synthara, a startup designing ultra low power and high energy efficiency hardware accelerators for deep learning algorithms. Today, he is the CTO of Sintara, leading the technology development and the research efforts of the company, focusing on both digital and mixed signal electronics. Please, Alessandro. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, does it work? Okay, so thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, we are a little late, so we'll try to shrink the presentation to avoid you to go home too late. Uh, the idea of today is that I'm going to present you uh, the research I did during my PhD. Uh, when Maurizio invited me here to, do, to give the presentation, the idea was to show something that uh, uh, is totally academic. So everything that you, that you are going to see is basically my PhD thesis with some parts cut out, but that has uh, some repercussion in, uh, in the real world. So it's not just a uh, theoretical world because uh, I was a student here, I was a student at Polytechnico and often I got the feeling that what we were doing was purely theoretical, especially when you're doing a PhD. But I want to show you that what you do can actually have some impact in the world and how does it look like a research that can be translated afterwards into, into, into a product. So uh, the two main topic of the presentation are going to be NULOPs and two NULOPs that are two uh, digital accelerators that I designed during my PhD thesis with the idea of showing what are the key architectural principles that I developed during this uh, four years. I will cut short the biography since I got already a nice introduction. The key point is that I'm an alumni. I was sitting in this very room about 10 years ago. Uh, and after that, I, been uh, for a while, let's say three, four years into the industry, working mostly uh, on GPU design. And, and then I got back to, to Zurich for my, for my doctoral, uh, doctoral research. And there I founded my current, uh, current startup. A startup that uh, most, of, most of the people actually don't know much about Zurich as a city. Uh, I can tell you that uh, Switzerland is highly underestimated in terms of beauty of the country and quality, quality of the city. And so this is the reason why I decided to stay there uh, to, found the, to found the company. Uh, again, briefly to give you an overview of what we are doing and how we are doing. Uh, now in 2020, we got our first investment round. We got our first uh, uh, bunch of uh, Swiss francs and we started hiring people. Uh, in this context, Maurizio, uh, my guest today, is uh, got in contact with us. We are growing quite fast. We have 11 people. And we are now expanding the team even more. We are looking for every kind of engineer. We, want, we are scaling up to more than 20 engineers. We are closing our second investment round. And all this, again, is based on the research that I'm going to show you. Uh, again, to prove that if you put the right effort during your academic career and your PhD career, you can actually get something out there. And it's not just all uh, theoretical work, what, uh, what we're going to do. Now, to jump to the actual interesting part, what I'm going to speak with you to do today is uh, edge intelligence. And so the first thing that we have to understand is what we, what we mean with edge intelligence. So with this very generic term in this presentation, I refer to any kind of device that requires data to be processed in place. Uh, a lot of times this is confused with IoT, but it's not just the case. So if you think a self-driving car, so it's not a small device, it's not a tiny device, it's actually a pretty big device, you can put a server on it. This is still an edge device. Why is still an edge device? Because you cannot, it's not possible, it's literally impossible to compute whatever kind of computation you need on the cloud. 
uh, you hear, for example, in, in the example of self-driving cars, a lot of noise about uh, uh, these um, telecommunication companies that want to do 5G driven uh, autonomous cars. Uh, they never answer the question, what happens when there is a gallery in the street and the car doesn't have signal? Uh, this is the kind of device, this is the problem that I try to solve during my, during my piece. What, what is common between all these devices is that they are battery powered and this implies energy efficiency. They require real time computation and so they must be high speed. At the same time, often they have to be mass produced and this implies low cost, that implies uh, a small chip power. The second topic of the thesis and of the presentation is, is the convolution on neural networks. I assume that almost everybody in the room is familiar with the principle of DLSI. Some of you may not be familiar with what is a convolution on neural network. So in the next slide, I'm going to give you uh, an introduction on the topic as well. But to make it very short, a convolution neural network is an AI algorithm that is ideal for processing images, so spatially correlated data. And today represents basically whatever state of the art of whatever visual task you can imagine. If you have Google Photo, that's, uh, that's a neural network, a convolution neural network. If you use, I don't know, uh, the emoji of the iPhone, the one that follows your face, that's a neural network. Uh, face recognition, biometrical scan, whatever AI application involving images that you can imagine today is done with some variant of convolution neural network. The problem of convolution neural network is that they require billions of operations. Uh, I even in my, not so much in my academic career, but in my professional career, I faced networks require one ter operation per frame. One ter operation per frame is a gigantic number that today requires a workstation to be, uh, to be computed. And of course, this is a huge challenge when it comes to implementing in something that is uh, energy efficient, but especially a uh, small area and so uh, low cost. So, these two topics together are the motivation uh, behind my work. Uh, we have a lot of needs and we have a big opportunity and this opens the ability to open, to create custom hardware that takes care of accelerating neural networks. In this presentation, I'm going to speak about CNS, but whatever neural network you, can, you know, you can find in literature, it has the same problem. It requires computing power. And as electronic engineers, our duty is to provide this electronic power in order to enable new uh, applications. Now, when, uh, when it comes to custom hardware, you can face the problem in different ways. You can start uh, taking just the throughput, you can handle just uh, minimizing the area. You can say, okay, uh, I just care about being low power, how fast you go, we don't care. In this presentation, let's say in my research, I always try to find a balance between these different aspects of the design. Uh, for sure, the main one, the driving force was energy efficiency. So having high throughput, but consuming uh, low power at the same time. But in general, everything had to uh, be somehow uh, balanced. I, didn't, I was not interested in creating, I don't know, a uh, one milliwatt accelerator that was not actually useful for anything. Uh, a lot of people do that. And, there is a lot of value in that research as well, but that was not uh, uh, my interest. Uh, when I started, it was late 2015, early 2016. The state of the art was uh, by ETH of Zurich uh, still. But, uh, the, the work was done by Luca Cavigelli, Lucas Cavigelli, uh, an amazing guy. If you are looking for some good papers in, in literature to read, I suggest you to look for him. Uh, today, he betrayed academia to join uh, Huawei and he's a senior researcher there. Uh, clearly they pay better than the ATH. Uh, but the work he did was one of the first of, uh, of let's say the modern wave of AI accelerators. And uh, he was famous for this matrix of uh, 437 gig operation per second per bar. So when I started my research, that was the figure I was trying uh, to do. To give you a little more context, today uh, has been, well today, about seven months ago when I updated this slide last. Uh, the state of the art uh, is represented by MediaTek. This is, uh, I think it was a seven nanometer chip, the one I pick up for this slide, that it provides more, almost 20 times more energy, energy efficient. So the, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of improvements that have been in the last five years and that happened in parallel to the work I'm going to talk about. So starting from the work of Lucas, I, uh, started to design NULOP. 
an accelerator that was trying to, uh, to improve the computation of uh, CNNs, leveraging sparsity. Uh, leveraging sparsity, we are going to see more in detail what it means, but in general, the idea was that convolutional neural networks are highly sparse. There are a lot of things inside a convolutional neural network that is zero, and we want to, to leverage that in order to get a performance, a performance scale. But before reaching to sparsity, uh, a key topic when we speak about neural networks is what kind of data types we care. Mm, traditionally, uh, AI algorithms, but in general, scientific computation is plotting point. And that was as well the starting point for uh, convolutional neural network. And still today, most of them are trained using standard uh, plotting points. So let me take a pointer here. Pointer. Yeah. So standard plotting points. So we have a, a, a significance that is 23 uh, bits. We have an exponent. We have the sign. Is a data type that is great when you have to carry on scientific computation because it's highly precise at the same time as a very large dynamic range. But unfortunately, when it comes to hardware, it's a pain. So uh, I don't know if how many of you are uh, nerd enough to check every day what is the size of the last core by AMD in terms of CPU and GPU, but you will realize that the GPUs today are far larger than the CPUs. And the reason is that a GPU includes a gigantic amount of data paths required to support plotting points. In case of GPUs, even 64-bit plotting points. And this is a huge difference from CPUs that, well, they need a, if they, they have eight cores, just eight plotting point pipelines, a lot of times they're even shared between different cores. And so you can shrink the area a lot. And so this clashes somehow with the idea and, and my interest in finding uh, uh, energy efficient and relatively small chips to accelerate neural networks. And so I started using what is very common actually today in uh, AI industry that we just start to use integer or fixed point numbers. So we just totally discarded the, the need for, uh, for an exponent. We rely on the people on the theoretical side to find a way to try and to train these networks and to prepare them to be used for inference. And it's true for them, the work is a lot harder. But today it's possible to train a neural network with integer data types without basically losing any accuracy. And this is a gigantic advantage for, uh, for us that we design hardware. And uh, now, now that we have fixed the data type, uh, in order to get to the next step, that is understand the optimization I implemented, a short overview for those of you that are not familiar with convolutional neural networks. So a convolutional neural network is based on an input image that is overlapped with a kernel. Here is a three by three kernel uh, that is shadowed that moves over the image and progressively generates the output pixel, computing basically uh, a convolution operation. And the power of this operation lies in the fact that you need very few parameters. So the number of elements of this matrix is very small. And so it's very easy to train this network in comparison to other kind that can have uh, gigabytes, even tens or hundreds of gigabytes of parameters to be trained. So this is the real secret that led uh, convolutional neural network to their success. The second key operation that we're going to speak about today is pooling. That is a downsampling uh, operation. Uh, it's again, a relatively simple operation. Here you see we have four values that are compacted to become only one, you pick in the maximum. And the reason for that is that a lot of information in our visual field, this comes very close from biology, is not really necessary. Uh, once my brain grasps that the object in front of me is a chair, it doesn't really need to remember that every single picture in front of me is a chair. Everything can be collapsed very easily into uh, a single value, especially when you start working into an higher dimensional space. It's, uh, uh, it's a redundant information that we, we, can, uh, we can discuss. And the third operation that is going to be, let's say, protagonist of the next part of the presentation is the so-called RELUS uh, that stands for rectifying nonlinearity. That is the simplest nonlinearity you can imagine. You take your matrix, you take the values that are negative, you set them to zero. And this is the actual magic that makes neural network work. Uh, I don't know how much you remember of your uh, analysis and geometry class, but if you multiply two consecutive uh, metrics, one, do a matrix multiplication with another matrix multiplication, the two operation can be collapsed into a single matrix multiplication. 
So it's really useless to have a chain of such operations because they can become a single one. In the moment you have this nonlinearity between the multiplication, well, the story changes and you create a system that has a lot higher representational power because you are carrying on nonlinear operation, nonlinear transformation, and this allow you to create a more powerful system that can learn more, uh, more to do more complex uh, stuff. But for us, uh, from the point of view of an hardware engineer, what is interesting of this uh, ReLU nonlinearity is that brings sparsity. And one of the, my very first work was to do an analysis of how much sparsity was involved in, uh, in network heavy in the ReLU. It was already known at theoretical level in the past, but we, we have been among the first wave of groups doing it scientifically. And what we did is that we realized that uh, neural networks, standard floating point neural networks here in blue are very sparse. You can see that uh, on average, we are talking about uh, uh, more than 50% of the values of the metrics in the, in the network are zeros. But if you quantize the network, the sparsity jumps even higher. Uh, here I write 70%, but uh, what we see that with minimal effort to push sparsity, you can even get 90% sparsity in the neural network. And of course, since we are performing a convolution operation that is based on multiply of accumulate operations, well, every multiplication by zero is zero. So it's just a waste of energy, a waste of time, a waste of uh, memory access. And this gives a significant possibility for uh, performance gain, energy saving, and general uh, performance uh, uh, improvement. So starting from this observation, I designed uh, an algorithm that is called SMNZVL in a not so uh, amazing way that is based on the concept that we want to reduce the data transfer from the chip to the DRAM. So it's really fundamental in order to reduce the overall system uh, power consumption. But at the same time, we want to be able to skip over this operation that involves a zero without the need to decompress the data. Because in the moment you take the data, you transfer them from the DRAM to your chip, you decompress that, well, you have lost any possibility to gain advantage. You have your zeros, they are back, you cannot really do much. And before I started my work, that was actually what was happening. Uh, you may find the, in literature, for example, a reference of Iris from MIT. They had this historic array. Uh, it was very popular, mostly because financed by DARPA. And basically what they were doing is that they were compressing the data outside the chip bringing it on chip, decompressing them and feeding the zero back into the pipeline and just clock gating every unit that was going to multiply by zero, but that was not really a performance gain. They were merely save the last step uh, of power consumption, but they were not uh, completely taking advantage of sparsity. And with my research, I wanted to uh, get beyond that. So the idea has been to create an algorithm based on a sparsity map and a list of non-zero values. So we take our input array. In this case, it's a very simple four by four array with just three values. We create a binary map that is only one bit per entry. And together we side with it a list of values that are non-zero. So the compression advantage is clear immediately. And uh, uh, the idea is that with this structure, it's very easy to uh, take the information and, and decompress it locally. How? Well, this is how a stream of compressed data will look like. So this is a 16-bit word. Uh, well, imagine that we are now compressing data that are all 16 bits. We have at the very beginning our sparsity map with a single one inside. So we know that the next value coming in is an actual value, a non-zero value that we have to use. And counting the number of zeros here at the beginning, we can count the original position in the position in the original metric. And this implies that with this simple this two data, we need everything that is necessary in order to reconstruct and to use the value, the decompressed value. Uh, here we have another example. We have a sparsity map that is completely zero. So we know that no actual value is coming after it. And afterwards, it's uh, uh, again, another sparsity map with some ones. So if we continue the list, there will be more uh, values coming afterwards that have to be uh, understand by the system as actual activation of the of the neural network. And this, is, this system is very powerful because it's simple. Uh, 
one of the problem of other existing uh, uh, algorithms for, uh, for leveraging sparsity, but in general for compression, is that uh, they require overhead. And uh, uh, as you will discover as soon as you start designing a very complex system, uh, or when you jump into industry, it, it doesn't really matter if your algorithm is one or two percent better than another one. If it requires 10% more hardware, nobody's ever going to use it. And that was uh, the problem, for example, um, of the accelerator I mentioned before, Iris, he was using a sparsity map, uh, sorry, a uh, run length encoding uh, that uh, requires counters, that requires adders, requires very large register to be actually be used. And as a problem with the locality of this coding, as a lot of special cases inside, and overall as the problem that the decoding circuitry is very big and it doesn't really work well with the need of working with low power or, and IE high frequency. Uh, okay. And furthermore, the advantage of the system of this algorithm, when you compare it with uh, uh, the aforementioned run length encoding is that not only it's, it's simpler, but it's also better of compression. Uh, especially uh, for this range, let's say the mid range of sparsity, that is where most of the network lies, we get that the, uh, the compression ratio is better for uh, the line in blue here and here that represent the uh, sparsity map based, uh, based compression. And even more important, critical factors a lot of people often forget is that uh, here you can see the level at which the sparsity, the compression becomes uh, gainful. So uh, if you look here, the red line, you see that the run length encoding has the problem that if the sparsity is low, you cannot really use it. You are increasing the size of the matrix. And a lot of you, I'm pretty sure are thinking, well, it's not a big deal. No, you just turn off the circuitry taking care of that. The problem is that now you need two circuits one taking care of the decoding of the dense data and one that takes care of the sparse data. You have just double your area, you have just double your leakage. And when you start playing with ultra low power, well, the leakage is one of the key factors that plays the game. Uh, to give an idea, the chip we are designing today, the ALU array, it's uh, 380 milliwatts and 180 of them are leakage. So it, it becomes a, a big factor when you can uh, when you cannot shrink the area you need to double every kind of frequency but the sparsity map based system as soon as you get to a, a very low level of sparsity well everything afterwards is just all pure uh, pure gain so once i designed the grid of course it was necessary to design a system in order to implement it and improve its validity and this is the uh, the first acceler accelerator design nulop it's an accelerator that was based on the principle of layer by layer computation. So we have the network which is stored on an external DRAM. We have to start the first layer. We move the weight of the first layer on chip. We compute the layer. We, we take the weight of the second layer. We move them on chip and we keep going on and on layer by layer until we get to the end of the neural, of the neural network itself. It's a pretty uh, simple principle by itself, but the hard part was to design these blocks here on top. That is the one that was taking care of implementing the sparsity, the sparsity based pipeline, and as well the output, uh, the output block that was taking care of recompressing the output in order to be ready for the next pass, as well implementing the ReLU and the pooling uh, and the pooling operation. Uh, something that is particular is that 90% of the area lies in this block that is actually. I would say 20,000 lines of code in an accelerator that is 250,000 lines of code. So the, most of the area is actually not interesting, let's say from an engineering point of view. Uh, the results of the accelerator uh, were pretty good already for the first time. We presented them at MIT 2016, uh, about seven, eight months after my PhD start. Uh, we, pro we, we did every estimation using Global Fund is 28. Unfortunately, we were not able to tape out the chip. So everything is just, all the numbers I'm going to show you today are actually based on post place and route switching activity propagation on a simulated network. Uh, the reason is that a tape out in GF28 is 150K. Uh, my project was sponsored by Samsung. They were generous, but not so generous to pay me the, the tape out. Uh, however, 
the number were pretty satisfying at the time. So here in the photo, you can see the, the demo we were uh, playing at, uh, at NIP. So basically we designed a system playing rock, crystal paper against, uh, against the camera. But the number was particularly satisfying when we were comparing it with what was existing at the time. So here you can see on the first row, NULOP. Uh, the metrics that I, I was interested the most, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, was the energy efficiency. And you can see that at the time was already uh, almost three times better than any other alternative and was almost, uh, I think it's seven, eight times better than what was the starting point of, point of my research, the, the research of uh, Lucas uh, at ATH. AT and uh, well, that was interesting, but when I prepared this presentation for my PhD defense, it was even more interesting to look at it backwards because if I, we compare it with the 2020 state of the art, we can see that, yeah, MediaTek clearly outdid it. It's more than twice, but despite five years of difference and jumping from 28 nanometers to five or seven nanometers, there was a little more than a factor of two. And that if you look at Samsung, despite they using eight nanometer process, uh, the jump was very minimal. Or I will almost say that in the right testing condition, it could have been uh, uh, better something ironic because they paid my research and they actually implemented on, on, on top of that. Uh, after the first year of research, I would say experimented a little. Uh, I designed other, another accelerator that here I'm not going to speak about with, with the idea that it's possible to get a further gain if you are able to dynamically tune the number of bits of each multiplication in order to uh, shut down part of the circuitry. I experimented uh, uh, training neural network with different techniques. Uh, I'm not I'm not tracing all of these here because they told me I have 30, 40 minutes and I want to, to kill you. But all these research at the end somehow uh, contributed to my second accelerator, my last accelerator, that is uh, Chunulo. That is built on top of what just I just described you. So it wants to keep the same the same principle but it wants to add uh, the idea of kernel sparsity. So, so far we spoke about, okay, we have this ReLU operation, it generates sparsity. The sparsity is something that we can use. But then uh, at the time in, uh, in, a, in, uh, in the field, a lot of people were researching, okay, what if we take the other metrics, not the uh, input metrics, but we take the weight metrics of our, uh, of our algorithm and we introduce zeros there. So we, we, we double the sparsity. And I kept, I started working on the same line of research to see if it was possible to uh, implement it in what I did before or if the two principles were uh, orthogonal. Uh, a starting point, again, the data type, as I mentioned before, plotting point is what is there normally on whatever supercomputer or GPU or server. Uh, while fixed point is what I was using in my NULOP accelerator. And in this intermediate period that I told you uh, where I experimented a little with different uh, principles, I started asking if it's possible to get the best of both. And the answer is what I call block plotting point. So it's not a principle that is totally new. It's a principle that uh, has been experienced in different way, in different points of time, in different applications. But what I did has been taking the idea and bringing it into custom hardware accelerator. So as for plotting point, we have here an exponent uh, that indicates how much, what is the magnitude basically of this uh, significance. The, the peculiarity is that while in a normal plotting point, you will have an exponent for each one of the, of the numbers. Here for an entire array, we have a single exponent. This has a huge impact, first of all, in the storage. We need only to store one number instead of storing uh, uh, a million of them if we are talking about a large array. But even more important, since we know that the exponent is shared among the whole metric, when we do a metrics matrix multiplication, we can just take the number as their integer. We can just use an integer pipeline and this simplifies the logic by orders of magnitude. You don't have to deal with all the shifting and uh, uh, normalizing that is uh, implied in a IEEE compliant uh, uh, plotting point uh, plotting point standard. Now, while there was a lot of research on just using integers, uh, and I could just say, okay, my null of accelerator is going to use integers because everybody is doing that. I don't need to prove that it works. It was not the case for this algorithm, and so I had to start from training some neural networks. So, 
the first one that I started from is an example of uh, uh, generative adversarial network. Uh, I don't think I have the time to give you an exact overview of what it is, but basically the idea is that we have two neural networks playing one against the other, and one is trying to fool the other that is trying to generate data that looks realistic. And in this very first example, the idea is that we are taking this small image here and we want our neural network to recreate Kira Knightley in her original uh, shape. And basically, one of these two images is, has been generated by uh, our normal floating point data. One is, has been generated by my customized uh, data type. The problem of this system, of this kind of network is that you cannot have a metric. Uh, so if you read the original paper about uh, SR GANs, uh, they ask a thousand people to tell what is the best image reconstruction. This is the actual st golden standard. And uh, well, at the end of the day, the, up, the upper one here is floating point, the lower is block floating point. If you are very careful, maybe you can notice, can notice a, uh, a mismatch, but from the very small sample of people I used, there was about 50, the two images can be compared in terms of quality reconstruction. And this was the first proof that the problem uh, was solved by the custom block floating point data type. The second attempt was our image segmentation. So the idea is that we take a, our picture of our cat and we want to get the shape out of it. And again, I made the comparison between a floating point and a block floating point uh, neural network. And again, the results are quite uh, uh, similar. <clears throat> Here, there is a, a little more uh, uh, metrics available when it comes to segmentation because it's basically a pixel by pixel classification task. And uh, uh, the two were comparable, except in a couple of tasks where block floating point was actually performing better. Uh, I didn't report it here because it's not a scientific finding because I never dig enough into it. Speaking with some theoret theoret theoretician, uh, we got to the conclusion that it was bec because uh, when you reduce uh, the ability of the network to change value, you are cutting some noise. So you introduce some regularization. Uh, this work was done uh, in collaboration with uh, Mathieu Cobario uh, at Mila with Yosha Benjo in, uh, in, uh, in Canada. And they agree with the, the, this vision of uh, uh, noise cutting uh, regularization uh, implied in, in quantization. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the opportunity to, to dig uh, into, into it uh, more. A last example of network that we train, it actually got published. I did it with uh, a student of mine. It was a semester project that we did uh, together when I was at the university and was with the ATH racing team. So ATH has one of the most competitive uh, student racing teams uh, in Europe. I think they have also some, uh, some record and some championships won. And uh, I was collaborating with the autonomous driving team in order to improve their track detection system. With the idea that uh, they didn't want just a neural network performing well, but they want a neural network that was also able to uh, run on something that was small and, uh, and low power. And with a student of mine, we trained this network, used block floating point. We pushed a lot to the concept of variable bit precision. So we had even two bit weights in the network. And as a result, we outperformed largely the original implementation. And here, if like this, yeah, here you can see an example of the neural network performing uh, on a video of the car. And so basically it's able to detect consistently where the edges and where the cones delimitating the, the track uh, are located, uh, despite the fact that it's using only three bits for the weights and using a block floating point based system and not a full floating point uh, system. Now, once the data type got fixed, got determined, uh, it was the time uh, to get back to the concept of sparsity, the title of my second, uh, of this, of this second, uh, second chapter. Now, the problem of sparsity when it comes to the kernels, when it comes to the weights of the neural network, is that the kernels are not sparse. Um, it doesn't matter really how you train the network, even if you start playing with regularization, normalization, they will never get too sparse. And so uh, this is not really uh, a good starting point for an accelerator. So what uh, people have done over time is that they introduce what is called pruning. Uh, and a lot of people, when they first heard the principle that we just take the weights and we just decide to discard some of them, we kill the smallest one, uh, it's very natural to think that this is somehow an artifact that we invented 
but it might surprise some of you, this is an extremely biological uh, mechanism. When a human being is born, his brain is full of synapses. There are far more synapses in a, new, a newborn than in any of us. And as we die, they progressively die out. And this is the reason why it's so hard to learn new concepts when you are old. You have far less synapses, and so basically your representative power has decreased a lot over time, and you're unable to uh, advance your knowledge easily. And basically, we implied the same, uh, we use the same principle, I think, as being Jan Lecun, who do it first. Uh, the, place, the paper was titled Optimal Brain Damage, Optimal Brain Surgery, or something, something like that. And the idea is really that you can actually increase the quality of your neural network, its performance, while removing uh, some connection in the network, while creating some, uh, some disease. Uh, today, the field exploded. There are many algorithms. There is the different rules to select which weights to remove. You can have structural pruning, unstructural pruning. You can have pruning that follows um, an entropy equation that I, I will never be able to understand. So I say that the field grows a lot. Uh, but the key point is that you can e reduce the number of connections, the number of weights in your kernels, even of, by 90%. And this can be done without damaging the neural network performance itself. And this, again, if you're an hardware engineer, is amazing because you have, again, 90% of operation that you can just skip if you design the system in the right way. Uh, at the very beginning, I started from the simplest one. I just say I don't want to, to constrain myself anyhow. I just take my, my kernels, I prune them, I use 75% as uh, reference sparsity because it's an accessible number. Everybody in literature thinks it's almost a low number, so I'm not uh, overselling anything that I do. I, I just take a, a, an average number. I prune the network. I check that the performance is actually okay, and then I try to uh, feed them into my my architecture. Now the architecture is a derivation of what I showed before. Mm. The only difference between what I did with, between weights and activation is that for the weight, I decided to not keep them uh, compressed. So everything is dense, but still I was able to skip over the uh, zeros in the, in the weight matrix in order to uh, save operation. And uh, uh, the idea is that I was able to do that thanks to this pipeline. So here we are receiving the uh, activation, the sparse activation from our input processor. Uh, and we get an activation that has a sideband, a side information, the spatial positioning of the activation itself. Uh, here we have some controlling logic that is selecting the activation and is checking if, uh, uh, if the activation has actually to be multiplied by a weight that is zero or not, thanks to a sparsity map specific for the weight that is stored in a separate uh, SRAM band. And if there is at least one multiplication, the activation is taken, is feeded to the next stage of the pipeline together with the information about the multiplication that have to be carried out. And in an ideal scenario, it means that every activation that is non-zero is going to only to be multiplied and take as many clock cycle as the non-zero weight in the, uh, in the weight matrix. And that was also my hope as well when I did the first test on the architecture. And it was partially the case, but it was not enough. Uh, it was not enough because, as you can see here, we have an increase in energy efficiency. We have uh, an increase in throughput, but also an increase in power. And if you do the math, if you take into account that I was using 75% with sparsity, something didn't really add up because you should get a factor of four of increase. You can say, okay, maybe four is too much because, you know, uh, the, there is an overhead uh, for, uh, for the logic and everything, but it's really far away from what we are seeing. Here we are basically seeing a factor of two. So something was wrong, something was uh, not, uh, uh, not working. And analyzing the internals of the architecture, uh, something that I did with uh, an automated test bench. I don't know how many of you are familiar with advanced verification, but if you want to work in industry, I suggest all of you to study uh, UVM test benches. Uh, using that, I realized that it's true, uh, my weights, my multipliers were never multiplying anything involving a zero. The problem was that there was a huge imbalance between the different pipelines. And the reason for that is that I was just taking the weights of my kernels, killing the smallest one, 
and computing what was still there. And that was really not an efficient way because what you can get is that one kernel can completely die. So we have removed the smallest weight in magnitude. And this, there is nothing to compute here anymore. While another one like this uh, bottom right here can still have a lot of operation. If we assign to different pipelines, the different values, well, at the end of the day, we get that one max unit is completely idle while the other one is only computing zero is 100% utilization, but is bottlenecking the wall, the wall system. Uh, to get beyond that, I got back to the algorithmic side and I say, okay, uh, I wanted the most possible general accelerator. Maybe this is not really possible. This is not really the case. So I used the most simple uh, pruning announcement that you can find in literature that is I stopped pruning everything layer by layer and I started pruning the arrays kernel by kernel. So somehow I was enforcing that locally the sparsity of a single kernel matrix was, uh, was constant. And this implies that, for example, here instead of having zero, all zeros, I have still two values. Here again, I have still two values and so on and so on. And this is the fact, the fact that if, I, if we go back to the previous example, here, in theory, I should get all zero because the weights of this kernel are a lot, uh, a lot, a lot smaller. So when I did that, I feed them to the accelerator. And of course, what happens was that the uh, workload unbalance disappeared and the accelerator was able to provide center operation per second per bus, uh, clearly beating whatever was existing at the, uh, at the time, including the accelerator from, from Samsung and MediaTek. That was say that they were the reference point when I complete my second uh, my second accelerator, despite the fact that again we are talking about 28 nanometer process that in 2020 is kind of uh, primitive. And another big topic uh, in the field besides the raw uh, energy efficiency is other efficiency, because as I mentioned at the beginning, if you want to sell a million of them, well you need to make them cheap. And a very positive things of the architecture design before is that the area, the area efficiency is high in comparison to uh, what are the other accelerators in literature and is still comparable with the others, with the two best ones, despite the difference in technological name. And as I will see in few slides, this is still a big topic today uh, for reasons we will analyze in the next, uh, in the next few slides. So to conclude, in this presentation, I presented you two accelerators, uh, NULOP and two NULOPs, and I show you what, how good are these numbers. And uh, uh, since a question that I got asked a lot is what's next, this slide has the idea to show you what's next. And what's next is the so-called DRAM power. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard about it, but uh, when it comes to computing today, the access to the external memory is what kills all of us. Uh, you can be the most amazing DLSI designer of the world. You are going to get full performance because when it comes to access to external data, well, it's horrible. Uh, here I use DDR3 memory, low power DDR3 memory, I think. And the number are bad. If you pick DDR4, maybe it gets better. But the core message is that you lose almost 50% of your energy efficiency when it comes to that. And this is why designing a chip, not only for the chip, but a chip inside a system is fundamental uh, because we have always to pick the context in which you're operating. I did it during my research. This is why I focus a lot on compression, but it's really what is the current uh, focus of the industry. You can take your accelerator and make it as much efficient as you want. Now the bottleneck is the DRAM power and it will always uh, be the one that determines if your work is good or if your work uh, is bad. A second open topic that is actually what we are working now at Quintara and we are trying to fix with our next generation of accelerators is the problem of the place and route. So I don't know how many of you uh, got it when I was presenting it, but here we have, uh, when I presented you NULOP, I presented you an accelerator that has 128 multipliers, each one with a memory bank for the weight and each one with a memory bank for the sparsity map. That means 256 uh, memory banks. I did some optimization. I did some sharing of resources. We got still more than 200 memory banks. 
Now, it's global. You can do the place and route for 200 memory bands. The problem is that you're going to waste all of that. And that's the second big topic for these uh, high efficiency accelerators. We still uh, consume a lot of area. Everyone consumes too much area, and a lot of people are working on finding a way to keep the performance constant while saving, uh, saving the area. Uh, to conclude, I show you uh, the two accelerators. Uh, these are the two layouts, mm, just to show that it's actually numbers that are based on something that existed and not just as I put on a slide to compute. Uh, so if you have any question, I'm happy to answer here or afterwards in private if some of you is shy. Uh, I just want to thank uh, uh, my home institute at university, of course, my team and my company, because I had a lot of ideas, but they are the ones that are making an actual uh, real device. Uh, they are the ones that are translating the vision in something concrete. And Maurizio for organizing uh, the call today and inviting me today. Thank you.